everybody for joining us. We're so excited uh, to have you here and to show you our beautiful distillery and tell you a little bit um, about our story and how we got to where we are. Um, I know that some of you picked up a package um, or had a package delivered from Barago with all of your cocktail ingredients and your bottle of full port rum. But we also have people who are participating from um, not in the state of Virginia, outside of the Commonwealth and uh, they may have a different type of rum or they may not even have rum, they may just be watching this. So we'll try to make it interesting for all of you. Um, but I think that the majority of you are probably very thirsty right now. So I'm gonna turn it over to Rain Castle, our head bartender, who's gonna walk you through making a very classic rum cocktail, three ingredient cocktail that's super easy, an old fashioned daiquiri. Hi everyone, I'm Rain. Um, yeah, we're gonna make a classic daiquiri. So you've got your limes, I hope you've been able to juice them. Um, and um, simple syrup. If you were able to get that made as well. If not, it's really simple. It's just equal parts um, hot water and sugar. So you can just mix that up right now. I'll give you a second. And I'll put the camera down so you can see what I'm doing. So I'm gonna start with two ounces of the rum. And then I'm gonna do uh, one ounce of simple syrup and one ounce of lime juice. Put it all in there. Add some ice. And then we're just gonna give it a good shake. All right. I'm gonna double strain it into our glass. I chose a, a coupe. Um, if you've got a Hawthorne strainer, that's great. If not, there we go. Just garnish it with, with a lime wheel. That's my favorite. And there you go. Thank you, Rain. Um, we will uh, give you guys some information, talk to you and answer questions until um, about 625 or so, and then we'll make our second cocktail, the painkiller. Um, That's okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, we've done a couple of these over the last few months, especially in the pandemic. Uh, Miss Gavin still seems to be looking like she's making her cocktail. Um, it usually works better when it's, uh, from our perspective, when it's a little bit more uh, Q&A and participatory. So if you have questions, don't think you have to wait to the end. Um, just bark them out or type them in. It, uh, it tends to make the conversation a little bit more fluid. Um, and we think that's kind of cool too. Uh, another thing before Vicki tells you about where we came from and how we got here, um, you'll note throughout this little discussion that, and part of the cool thing is that that I kind of geek out on is that William and Mary is uh, obviously historically uh, bound, if you will. Uh, rum is very much the same way. There's the history of rum in this country and around the world is, is quite simple, uh, quite interesting and not so simple. Uh, but the first dose of history that you get, I actually looked this up today. So the daiquiri that you're making now, um, just for your references, the earliest reference to a daiquiri was in 1914 believe it or not. Uh, and then sadly, unfortunately today, most people think of daiquiris as something that you tap off a Slurpee machine or the equivalent of a Slurpee machine. That's not the case. What Rain made just now is three ingredients and you would never know that it's just three ingredients. <clears throat> um, and then finally the daiquiri kind of took off big time in about 1937 when Hemingway uh, started modeling his own version. Uh, and the Hemingway daiquiri showed up in 1937 and by 1947, 10 years later, the size of the cocktail, his cocktail that he referred to as the Papa, Papa Doble, had doubled in size. 
uh, and uh, added more grapefruit juice and everything else that he got into it. But uh, it's interesting that that became a huge cocktail primarily because of him. And to this day, oftentimes people in Rain will be the first to tell you that the Hemingway daiquiri is often more time more popular and better known uh, than the daiquiri itself. Just a little history on the drink that you're drinking. Good, thanks, Brad. That's actually a, a good way to um, to lead into what we wanted to talk to you about. A lot of it is the history of rum, the history of sugar, um, but we also wanted to, I guess, give you a little bit of a, a glimpse into our lives and how we got to where we are. Um, Brad and I met um, as freshmen at the College of Wayman Mary. We lived in the same dorm. Yates. And, uh, and started dating our freshman year and dated all through college. And then we ended up going to the same graduate school and went through graduate school and then got married after that. So um, we've been together a really long time. Um, and we actually have a son who's at Wayman Mary now who's graduating uh, on Saturday. So we're really excited to get back to Williamsburg again. Um, so Virago Spirits has been open two and a half years. Um, so we started this definitely as second, third, fourth careers. Um, when Brad was in law school um, after college, before we got married, um, he couldn't afford beer and beer was a necessary part of our weekends. Um, so I gave him one year, one of these little beer kits. And weekdays, by the way. Yeah, some weekdays. Um, so I gave him this little beer kit. And so this was in 1990, 1990, 91. Well, the dates really don't matter. It was a long time ago. And, um, and so he really embraced this beer kit and started making um, great, fabulous beer and made beer and, and his homebrew business side business, fun business, weekend business, um, really grew. And um, Brad made beer for weddings and for friends and family events and for- Not for profit. Not for profit, yeah, it's totally for fun. It's off the radar. No, and to, she worked for TTB exactly, or something. I, did, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> and for how many years did you do that? Like, uh, I don't know. It's been over 30 years now. Yeah, but yeah. again, dates are irrelevant. Um, and so, um, he and his brothers also always thought about doing some sort of a business together. And for a long time, we thought it was going to be a brewery. Um, when everybody got their lives together, their finances, their children, their personal activities, their jobs, that ship had sailed, especially in Richmond. Um, there's the breweries in Richmond and around Virginia are so extraordinary. Um, the thought of even trying to compete in that market was just more than we could consider. Um, so we dropped everything. And that was probably, what, about maybe eight or 10 years ago? Well, yeah. So we dropped that idea completely and everything just sat. It was like, well, I guess a family business just isn't going to happen. And then they, the Brad and his brothers kept talking about spirits and cocktails and where they traveled and who they met in this incredible cocktail that they had in this remote location and the friends that they made sharing that cocktail. And have you ever heard of this spirit that's in this remote area of the Caribbean that no one can get here, that kind of thing. And it just slowly became this business plan um, to open up a distillery and to focus on forgotten and misunderstood spirits. Um, there are a lot of bourbon distilleries in Virginia um, there are a couple of really good vodka distilleries in Virginia. Um, there's a lot of moonshine in Virginia. Legal and otherwise. Legal and otherwise. Not a whole lot of rum distilleries. And one of the main reasons is because people think of rum as that mistake in Fort Lauderdale um, during spring break and you wake up the next morning and swear you're never ever gonna have rum again. Um, and so, Brad's that way with tequila, was, however, was. was that way with tequila. Not, um, so we really wanted to, to produce a rum that appeals to bourbon drinkers. So not necessarily a rum that you would think of as a Slurpee style drink or a sweet something sitting on the beach, but more of 
a sipping rum um, that is also great in cocktails, but something that's more of a, um, what would you, how, would you, how would you phrase it? It was, it was the, something that you would pour into, I would never use a snifter, but the equivalent of a snifter, right? And, and you wouldn't need to necessarily adulterate it in order to appreciate uh, where it came from and what it was supposed to be. Yeah, um, and a lot of rums have sugar added at the end and they're really delicious. But that's also why a lot of people don't like rum is because they're overly sweet or you feel really gross the next morning. And so people are surprised to learn that our rums don't have any residual sugar. Yes, the process starts with sugar or a, a, a form of sugar, but we distill it all away. Um, so a lot of people don't necessarily understand that. We also do more than rum, um, which we will get into a little bit later, but we rum was our flagship product. Um, Brad, do you want to talk a little bit more about sort of the why we chose rum and yeah, I mean, we were trying. Right? So I, 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 we entered into this with my two brothers, right? So I'm the lawyer in the family. Vicky's kind of the uh, HR person. Uh, my other brother was an investment banker, uh, and then went back and got his PhD. Uh, and then my other brother is like a bond <laughs> bond trader kind of guy in Chicago, um, and. I was always doing the geeky lawyer stuff uh, and they were always worried about the business plan and they tried to find, or we tried to find collectively, an, an area in the market that would be interesting to us from a historical perspective because that's kind of what it was all about. My, my, the same reason I went to William Mary is why we're doing rum. Uh, good education stuff, but it, there's a story behind it, right? Um, and, we did the, the research and bourbon's great. I drink bourbon all the time, but does Richmond, Virginia really need another bourbon distillery? I would argue no, right? Um, if you think about, it, it's interesting from a historical perspective in the 1970s, the American uh, alcohol industry, really the, the wine industry took off in California, right? Suddenly people were brewing or uh, making wine at home, uh, fermenting wine at home and uh, the California wines beat the French wines in this big competition. Suddenly we were all over the market, uh, all over the world in terms of the quality of, of our wines. And our 1980s, mid 86, all the way through the 90s, it, it was the craft beer explosion, right? Where our beers, which were traditionally horrible, think Schlitz, think, uh, I grew up in Detroit and Cleveland, so I could name a bunch of really nasty local beers that were there at the time. And our beers were, they were vestiges of of prohibition, right? People got used to drinking bad beer and wine and uh, during prohibition and that they taught their kids that. And for 70 years, it took us to get back to the point where we putting out something unique. Um, but the, the, suddenly the craft distillery uh, movement started in the mid 2000s, 2010, 2020s. And we're riding the same wave that those other two industries did before us. Uh, and they each have their own life cycle, right? So now, back in the mid 80s, people didn't drink bourbon, believe it or not. It was an old man's drink. And rye was an even older man's drink. Uh, but now it's all the rage, right? So what we did when we were looking at the type of uh, products that we wanted to put out, um, and you can see the still behind us, basically all we do is operate the equivalent of a winery uh, that just happens to have a really cool alambic pot still behind it or in front of it. But we, we didn't want to go where everybody else was going. So we wanted to find something that had a historical story behind it that was interesting, uh, particularly to Virginia uh, and Williamsburg uh, area, Richmond. Um, and bourbon had run its course. Uh, vodka was in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, and the only unaged spirit, or I'm sorry, the only aged spirit, color, brown spirit, uh, that really hadn't taken off at that point was rum. Um, you can get white rum, but there's also aged rums too. Uh, tequila had even taken off. Even now, if you look at mezcal and tequila, it's all the rage. Um, but rum has not yet done that. It's the wave that has not yet been, um, been uh, surfed, if you will. We decided to do that. So we picked up these spirits uh, that we thought were misunderstood and or forgotten, rum being the first one. Um, people, for, we can talk, we'll talk about the history of why it's been forgotten and or misunderstood, but, but also herbal products. So gin in particular is coming back 
but you've also got Amaro and Fernet and Absinthe and a lot of other herbal products that are big in Europe that still are not big here. And then you've got brandy. Uh, that's still behind us is a French brandy still called the Cognac still or a Lambic pot still. Uh, and there are five of them in the United States. We have one of them and it puts out a super high quality brandy, but people don't drink brandy anymore right now. Um, and that's a shame. And from an educational perspective, we're looking to, to, to show some people, A, the history of brandy uh, and rum uh, and herbal products in the US and to expand and, and uh, kind of capture a marketplace that doesn't currently really exist. So that's why we chose Roman brand. Right. Do you want to, um, well, I'm gonna look at a couple of questions that are out there. Um, somebody asked for the recipe for the Hemingway daiquiri. If you go to our website, we do have recipes on the website and I believe I'm pretty sure the Hemingway daiquiri is on there. Um, if not, shoot me an email um, and I'll be happy to send it to you, but I, I'm 90%. Don't you think, Rain, that it's on the on the website? Yeah, pretty sure they haven't made everything there. It should be on there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so too. Um, Cleveland does rock, Julie. Yeah. <laughs> um, the rationale behind the brand, and by the brand, I'm assuming you mean Virago Spirits. Um, Virago is a Latin term for a strong, powerful, courageous warrior woman. Um, and we, we sort of have changed that a bit to, to be uh, more androgynous, to capture everybody out there who um, sort of defines themselves instead of uh, allowing society to define them in any way that they choose. You know, it could be so many different uh, connotations to that these days, but we, when you visit our tasting room, you'll see that we have, um, paintings of viragos throughout the tasting room and ribbons around the room that have names of viragos. Um, so mostly historical figures, um, some fiction, some nonfiction, but people that just sort of felt strongly and passionately about a cause um, and did something about it and changed things for the better because of their um, because of their connection and yeah. passion about that particular We've, thing. Yeah, it used to be a person that was uh, female, but we de sort of degendered it. But it, it's somebody who defines themselves and rather than letting society decide what you uh, can and cannot be. And it's sort of why we selected the, the, the still behind us. The still behind us is very French. It, it was made in France, it was two and a half years ago. It was making cognac in France. Uh, we had a fleet of uh, French tradesmen that came here um, uh, and, and helped us install it. If you look at it, you'll see lots of little fleur-de-lis things all over it that do absolutely nothing. Um, the color of it does absolutely nothing. It looks really cool, right? But, you know, if the French saw what we were making on this, they, they would be horrified. Uh, but the reason for that is simply because we respect past, right? But we're pushing it a little bit. We want to make it a little bit different. So we too are Viragos and we're, we're, we're defining what we want to make in the way we want to make it. Uh, fortunately, we've been quite successful at doing that, but um, it's just an attitude. It's not like uh, you're um, being confrontational with anybody else. It's on the other hand, it's kind of like you're flexing your own uh, hubris a little bit to decide what you want to do and showing people that you can do something creative that might, they might have not have thought about it and they're welcome to come along for the ride. Right. Um, do you want to, before we make the painkiller, do you want to give a little bit of information about the painkiller so people know what they're making? Sure, yeah. So the painkiller that Rain will make here in a second, um, invented in the 1970s, okay? The 70s not known for a lot of creative, you know, creative things uh, for the most part, disco, uh, some really bad cars, uh, the Pinto, I think, exploded during that time. The Pacer was not that great. The AMC Gremlin was horrible. Um, but uh, there was a bar in the BVI's at, um, called the Soggy Dollar Bar. I don't know if you've been to Joe Van Dyke, but if you have there, this bar, uh, it's on an island that you have to swim to, basically, uh, because they have no dock next to it. So if you want to go there, that, you got to swim up there, and hence the name, the Soggy Dollar, because that's all they got paid in. Uh, with soggy dollars. Anyway, it was a woman named Daphne Henderson who created it. Um, there is a, a rum company called 
Plusers out of England now that has actually trademarked, uh, I should probably have Pam Gavin look at this for me, uh, the painkiller name. She's, they've, they've somehow roped uh, the name into their own uh, persona, but Daphne created it um, at the Soggy Dollar Bar, which still exists. So to the extent that you guys ever have a chance to, uh, you wanna go see cocktail history, uh, go to uh, the BVIs and, and tie up near the, uh, the beach and swim with your soggy dollars and spend an afternoon or two. Um, so this, the, the painkiller cocktail is actually one that we sell as a kit because it's been so popular and it's so easy to make. Um, and it's just nice to have, you probably have most of these ingredients in your home most of the time anyway. So Rain, you wanna take it over and teach how to make a great painkiller? Absolutely. All right. So I'll have the orange juice, the uh, crema of creme de coconut, uh, Coco Lopez is the brand we have here, um, and pineapple juice. And of course you will. And I've got some nutmeg to grate on the top, but that really just elevates it. Um, all right. So let's begin. I'm going to do one and a half ounces of the foil port rum. I'm going to do three quarters of an ounce of the coconut cream. And three quarters of an ounce of the orange juice. And then it's going to be um, two and a quarter ounces of the pineapple juice. All right, throw some ice in there. I'm gonna shake this up pretty well just to get the coconut cream all broken up and nice and frothy. Again, double straining is ideal. Um, I'm gonna strain it over ice into the glass. And top with some coke or with some uh, nutmeg. And that is it. Thank you, Rain. I think you guys are really going to enjoy that cocktail. Be sure to put in the messaging um, what you think about it. We, it. It's one of our favorites. So, Brad, you want to talk about the history of rum and sugar and why that plays such an important role and why rum is a forgotten spirit? Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because spirit uh, alcohol is a really good preservative, right? You can you could have a bottle of booze that your grandfather had, and if it was properly sealed up, oh man, I get, my... <laughs> hold on a second. I'll we'll have to share. Mm -mm. <laughs> um, it lasts forever, theoretically, as long as it doesn't evaporate, right? So basically you could take, if you had um, an apple tree in your backyard and you fermented the apples and made apple cider out of it, hard cider, or just squeeze the apples and made juice, It'd be wonderful, but it would eventually go bad, right? The history would disappear. Even photographs fade, but alcohol has the ability to last thousands of years, theoretically. Um, so that's why if you took that apple juice that you picked, or those apples from the, your you know, grandfather's tree and made it into apple brandy, it would last forever. Uh, so we've actually talked to people about doing exactly that where they have a child uh, and you make apple brandy with something that, you know, you go to Carter's Mountain out in, Williams, out in uh, Charlottesville or whatever, and uh, you pick enough to make an apple brandy and you age it and you keep it there for their wedding because it'll still be good, right? It's, it's history in a glass. And rum is exactly that. Um, I was thinking about how I wanted to talk about this. And it's funny because our eldest is graduating this weekend from William and Mary. And it just went back to, show me how things have changed so much. I remember typing my application uh, to William and Mary on these 
the, William and Mary was, was so traditional at the time that he, the, the paper was like like tan. It wasn't even white. It, it had its own little. It was just times have changed so much. Uh, but looking back upon it is kind of fun, and rum offers that same. Um, same type of opportunity. The more things change sometimes, the more they stay the same. Um, so really rum is a combination of three different histories. One is uh, distillation, the concept of distillation. Second is the sugar itself. And then three is basically politics. And those three of those things combine and you can figure out where, where we stand today with regard to rum. Um, first of all, distillation. Long story short, you got to go back way back into the uh, you know, uh, the Arab uh, chemists back in the like, ninth century, they started to figure out how, after they figured out fermentation, uh, they figured out how they could actually, it was all about medicine and, and alchemy and everything else. Uh, and they, over time, they eventually developed a still that was intended to simply attempt to separate water from alcohol in, that are mixed in a solution. The still behind us here is, to be quite honest with you, there are a lot more powerful stills. The still that you see behind us here has the technology from about 15 to 1600. Um, it has a computer on the front of it, but all the computer does is actually monitor temperatures. It doesn't change the actual art of distillation. Um, so it's kind of an interesting time. Uh, eventually, uh, you went from the Arab countries into uh, Mediterranean countries, um, and then throughout Europe. Uh, and most of the stills that you started with were this, what they call a pot still. It's a single pass still. So the, I'm trying to point to it, that little octagonal or hexagonal box back there is actually a, the still itself. Inside there is copper. Um, and uh, you heat it up and it attempts to evaporate the uh, alcohol out of solution. Um, and it, it's not necessarily an efficient uh, piece of equipment. Uh, it, what it does is, is very, uh, it's classic and it's beautiful, but it's, there are a thousand ways that you could do it more efficiently. Uh, and it wasn't until 1830 that they invented something that called the coffee still, uh, which is basically a continuous still. So you, here you fill it up, you turn it on, you run it for 12 hours, you empty it, you clean it, and then you fill it up again and do it all over again. With a continuous still, you constantly feed it with new wine or um, whatever you're distilling. And it just will continue to go. If you also uh, see any, if you've been to any stills uh, or distilleries, many of them have columns that look like they have portholes going up the, the top. Each one of those portholes on the inside is something called a bubble cap. And the vapors kind of ratchet like a ladder all the way up the top. Each one of those little ratchets is a separate distillation. So just for your purposes, if you see your favorite vodka and it says something like, oh, we distill it, you know, 45 times for your protection or whatever. Depending on the, the height of the still, that could be one pass through the still. It's not as impressive as it seems. But, you know, imagine that. Um, so anyway, we learned how to distill over time. Uh, fermentation, to be quite honestly, was, honest, was a little bit scarier. If you think about the first person to eat an oyster um, or any of the other odd foods that we don't eat all that often, the first person to actually drink something that's spontaneously fermented, kind of a gutsy call, you know? <laughs> um, I'm not quite sure I would want to want to do that, right? It's bubbling and there's probably some sort of film on the top of it. And somebody said, oh, I'm going to go for it. Uh, but it has an alcohol. Uh, they figured out what that was over time. And uh, slowly it, it, it got to the United States. Um, well, the colonies. Of the, time. the more, I think the more interesting one uh, hit piece of history is the history of sugar. Um, we take sugar for granted now. It's a commodity and it's dirt cheap. Um, matter of fact, if you look at the countries that continually make sugar today, they're often generally the, the poorest countries in the region. Uh, it is backbreaking work uh, and you don't make a lot of money off of it. That, always, that wasn't always the case. Um, sugar started in China and India. Uh, about 1000 BC. And by the time in, I've got it written right here, so it must be true. Uh, 650 AD, China was actually uh, trading sugar, okay? But it was not necessarily widespread in Europe and definitely not in the colonies. Um, believe it or not, 
uh, Christopher Columbus is rumored to have brought sugarcane seed on his second trip over here. Um, and the, the, uh, the Holy Crusades back in the day kind of uh, spread that all around Europe. Um, the other interesting thing that I think that people forget is from a historical perspective, you had Spain, Britain, and France were in, knee deep in their colonialization periods. And you kind of wonder why all these big countries were fighting over these little spits of sand in the middle of the Caribbean. Um, with the exception of Martinique and Guadeloupe, uh, and I think Barbados, um, which Martinique and Guadeloupe were always French uh, islands, and I think Barbados was always British. With the exception of that, I think every other uh, island in the Caribbean flip-flopped hands colonial powers back in the day. Why? Um, I, I think the easiest way to, to describe it around here is, is that the Caribbean during its day was the Middle East. Uh, we fight or help people fight uh, over oil in the Middle East. I, I hasten to say that if the, the Middle East had no oil, we would not be seeing a lot of the world strife in this area because people wouldn't be paying nearly as much attention to it. The same thing could be said about the Caribbean back in the 15, 16, and 1700s. They were all fighting for sugar. If you grew up in uh, Europe, chances are you did not ever have refined sugar. Um, you were lucky to get a piece of fresh fruit, maybe, and if you were wealthy. Other than that, not so much. Uh, honey even wasn't all that uh, readily available. So suddenly you have these, these uh, islands manufacturing granulated sugar. Uh, it was ex super expensive. It was going for the equivalent of $150 a pound today. So if you think about us fighting mm -hmm. over sand in the Middle East for oil, that sells for what, $75 a barrel? Imagine how much that barrel weighs in terms of shipping. Uh, it's a lot better to argue over $150 pound of sugar. Um, and as a result, you had these colonial, these, uh, colonial uh, countries out of Europe fighting over the ability to make sugar. Now, for those of you that, you that don't know, sugar is uh, a backbreaking process. You grow sugar cane, you take the sugar cane, it looks like bamboo, and you run it through a squeezer, like a, two uh, wheels that press this stuff together, and sugar cane juice kind of uh, trickles out the end. That sugar cane juice is sweet, but not as sweet as you might think. Uh, you then collect all that, you boil it, and you actually use the stock of the sugar cane as the fuel to, to boil it. As you start to heat it, the sugar actually crystallizes, and you scrape off the top. And you keep scraping and keep scraping and keep scraping. What's left at the end of the process is what is called molasses, okay? Um, and there are different grades of molasses. You, if, you, if you scrape it one time and then sell that molasses, that's called fancy or grade A molasses. It has the highest residual sugar. That's what we like to use. Um, and then if you keep scraping and scraping and scraping, eventually you figure out that you're, burnt, you're spending more in fuel than the value of the sugar that you're getting out the other end of it. At that point, you stop from an economic perspective and what's left over is called blackstrap molasses. This is the stuff that you get at your grocery stores where your grandma makes cookies and stuff like that. Um, eventually, they figured out that uh, when, when, when uh, the colonial powers started invading all these countries or these islands, uh, they brought with them Western diseases that pretty much uh, wiped out the, uh, the native population. They had no uh, ability to, to handle that. So uh, sugar being, uh, sugar manufacturing being an extens extensively labor intensive process, this is where the ugliness of the sugar and the rum industry comes in is that uh, the colonial powers were then started up a ugly uh, triangular trade route by which sugar and alcohol and slavery were all tied together. Um, the vast majority of the people that worked the sugar plantations in the Caribbean were of Western African descent. Um, and eventually it's rumored that the slaves were the actually the ones that figured out that the, uh, you could ferment molasses uh, by necessity, they were figuring out how to survive and they figured out how to ferment molasses in uh, without cultured yeast that we use today. Uh, and once they figured out that they could make molasses uh, ferment into a form of wine, uh, they had already figured out, the colonial powers had already figured out 
distillation. And it was only a matter of time before they started selling this stuff. Um, and they it eventually became to the point where the French islands were selling to the French, to France and the British islands were selling to only Britain and the, and the Spanish were uh, selling only to Spain. Uh, and as a result, because they were constantly battling in war, they didn't really cross trade all that much. Matter of fact, they, were, they each adopted laws that basically said you were prohibited from importing rum and or molasses from our enemies, which led to a many uh, a problem. Uh, but as a result, all of these countries, and if you go to the Caribbean, you can still see it today. If you go to a French island, the rum will taste completely different than the British island and different from the, uh, the Spanish. The Spanish uh, to this day is very uh, sweet um, and uh, very mild. Uh, they're usually done on uh, column stills. The British, not surprisingly, very brash, uh, funky, the, particularly the Jamaican stuff, doesn't surprise you there either. Um, they use a pot still. Uh, and then the French, uh, long story short, uh, they don't even make sugar anymore. They just ferment the juice that comes out of the sugar cane and make something called rum agricole uh, that other countries don't make. It's very grassy and unique. So uh, part of the reason we like rum is that the flavor profile of rum is exceedingly broad. If you're making bourbon, federal law here in the United States says that it, you have to do X, Y, and Z. And as a result, your flavor profile is only about that big. With rum, you could use, all it says is you gotta use sugars. It could be molasses, granulated sugar, sugar cane juice, uh, any grade of molasses. It could be a, a variety and different techniques. And as a result, you have, you could easily taste things that you don't know are rum, uh, which gives a huge opportunity for people like Rain who are using it to make unique cocktails and the like. So that was a long-winded question. I answered it with a short-winded question. Do you um, do you want to answer a couple questions and sure. then go on to your to your next piece, which sure. is um, so a few questions that have popped up. I'll see if I can get to those. Um, if any of the products that we have distilled, is it all aging or has anything been bottled? So this is we we thought we'd be fancy people. We viewed ourselves as fancy, fancy people. So we decided when we started this process that we were only gonna do aged products because we were too fancy to do unaged products. And then we started and we figured out how hard it was to actually run a business like this. And <laughs> considering that your only customer in Virginia is the ABC, which is also the, the regulatory agency that governs you, which is the lawyer in me cringes. But, um, as a result, we never thought we were going to, whatever we distilled, we were going to put in bottles, period. Uh, in barrels, sorry, period. Uh, and then ABC called us up and said, hey, will you make 151? And we were like, nah, I don't think 151 is our thing. And then they said, well, we have cash. And I went, oh, you have cash? Sure, we'll do that because we need cash. So uh, <laughs> we, we, we did do 151. And they're part of the reason, and again, um, the lawyer in me finds this hilarious, but Virginia ABC did carry 151 from Bacardi and a couple other country, uh, <laughs> companies, and they all backed out of the market. And the reason that they did that and gave little schlubs like us the opportunity to compete is because they, on the back of their label that nobody reads but the lawyers, right? And they had this little warning label that says, do not light on fire. The flame, it will be invisible and you may harm yourself. And it could be really hot. And then they went ahead and ad, put together ad campaigns of do our flaming root beer shots. And they have all these people partying with these shots. Sure enough, some person wore a tie and then decided to do a flaming shot. And, but he'd already had a few and he dribbled on his tie. And suddenly uh, Bacardi's writing a check for lots of money. And rather than try and rehabilitate this product, they simply said, we're not gonna do it anymore. So ABC actually needed the product. Um, needless to say, we're not doing any flaming shot uh, participation whatsoever. But. but it is interesting when we got in, when we started producing and bottling and selling the 151, we, we sort of did it like um, not really knowing what was gonna happen. We knew that ABC wanted it, but we thought, well, ABC is gonna be our only customer and that's that and that, that's fine. ABC has not been our only customer. We sell 
a lot of 151 out of our distillery store. Which is um, technically which is no but you know what i mean yeah, it's yeah, like yeah. we like we we didn't know who our customer was going to be mm -hmm. and we still, we still we're still trying we to figure who's out buying who's it. buying the 151 because we thought oh well it'll be college towns no it's not and then you know you would sort of look at your demographics and what people are buying are people buying if they're buying rum then 151 is probably going to be a product that they're going to buy no not so much so we're still trying to figure out who these customers are um if you are, um, I would encourage everyone to try it, even if you come to the distillery just to try it. It is, it is really good. It is 151, but it is really good. Yeah, and the other product we all, we never thought, well, we never thought we were going to age. This this was to tell you yet again when you start a business, you do things opposite of what you think you're going to do. When we made gin, we never anticipate aging gin. Guess what we're doing now? Aging gin and barrels. We still have gin that we make here that is not, gin is not designed to be barreled necessarily, but now barrel gin is a big thing. So we've actually got, we've worked with a, and it's interesting. We had barrels that we had rum in that I gave to a friend of mine who runs a local <laughs> meadery here in town. So if you know any of the mead guys in town, go see it. But he just, he fermented his mead in there and then gave the barrel back to us. And that he had a prickly pear mead. And now our gin is resting in, the barrel for the third time picking up the original rum and his prickly pear mead that i don't really know what a prickly pear tastes like but whatever our gin is going to taste like it so it's kind of an interesting uh i never you never thought you'd go down this road but what the hell somebody's also asking about distillery tours um so our distillery hours are changing a little bit starting in june we will no longer be open on wednesdays but we're going to be open for an hour later on uh, Fridays and Saturdays. Um, so we do do distillery tours, but I have to be honest, we've had a lot of trouble keeping up because we've been so busy. Um, so the best way to get a distillery tour is if you call ahead and sort of reserve it. Um, because if you just sort of show up and say, hey, I'd love a distillery tour, chances are we're not gonna have enough staff here because we're, we have so many customers. Um, but that being said, we love it, to do we, that. It doesn't yeah. cost anything. Yeah. You're not expected to do anything, buy anything. But we love, I mean, to, to walk people around and show them what we're doing, it's kind of, it's fun. It, 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 it's, uh, we enjoy it. So to the extent we can do it without you know, ignoring other people in the, uh, in the tasting room, we'd be happy. Um, somebody wants to know if we're going to be aging the 151. Our rum. So here, here's another, that's actually a really good question. So when you put rum into a barrel, um, a couple things happen, right? Uh, one is the barrel is watertight, but it's not airtight. So over the years that it's in the barrel, it oxidizes. That's actually a good thing. Um, secondly, uh, you push the temperature changes uh, from night to day and season to season, expand and contract the liquid, pushing it in and out of the barrel. All our barrels, for the most part, are used bourbon barrels. Um, that's, it's standard for uh, rum industry. Uh, so all of our rum is in bourbon barrels now. And technically, all of our rum that comes off the still is 151. It comes off our still at about 152. That was the other interesting thing was when ABC called us and said, will you sell us 151? We had just distilled, and we had like a few <laughs> thousand gallons of 152. So I took an eyedropper and put a little <laughs> drop of water in it, and we bottled it. It was awesome. Perfect timing. <laughs> Didn't have to do anything. Um, the question is whether you... And we're learning this, you, no one teaches you this stuff. If you, the stronger the spirit that you put in the barrel, the alcohol is a really good solvent. It dissolves a lot of stuff that water won't even dissolve, right? Um, if you put it in at a stronger, you're gonna, pull, you're gonna pull more wood flavors out, more tannin, okay? And maybe that's good, maybe that's bad. Uh, but at the end of the day, you have to blend it together. We did last year barrel basically 151. We barreled 152. And after a number of years, if you let it go for 20 to 30 years, you'd be you'd su not surprised to, to, to learn that eventually you end up with something about 80 proof through evaporation, right? Angel share, all that kind of stuff. But the 151 is strong that it pulls a lot, a lot of flavor. I don't think we're going to barrel 151 again. I think we're going to probably go at about 125. Um, and a lot of that depends upon where you are in the world. If you're up north, you have to go down lower because you don't evaporate as much. If you're down in the Caribbean, 
you can put in at 150, 160, but because of the temperature and the humidity, you'll evaporate most of that off anyway. So uh, the angel share is a lot more expensive down in the Caribbean than it does up in Boston, for example. Uh, we are just trying to figure out, we just figured out last week that we are evaporating anywhere between five and 7% per year, okay, in, in our facility here. Um, but there's really nobody, you got to figure that out over time. So I don't think we would ever buy a barrel 151 at that strength per se again, but. Um, somebody, Julie made a comment that 151 works great as a floater in almost any rum cocktail. And it was her dad's secret in his rum punch. And Rain does that quite a bit in our tasting room. We'll do a floater um, of 151 or add, Rain makes an incredible uh, daiquiri that's half four port rum and half 151. Um, that might be on our website too. Um, so there are a couple of different things that you can do with 151. We're making a zombie right now in the tasting room this month and next month that has 151 in it. Um, it is delicious, but we also do that with our gin products. We'll do a, a, a gin, a gin and tonic, but do a hibiscus gin floater. So um, we're big fans of floaters. Yeah, you know, again, I, not everybody on this call will admit this, but one person at this table sitting right here talking likes a 151 daiquiri without the, the half and half thing. <laughs> Just use the 151. Go for it. And somebody, I think it was Pam, you mentioned in the in the chat something about, um, I think it was renting the space. I, I don't, I think it was, that's what it was. Um, but our tasting room is um, open to the public for tastings on a regular basis, but we also do have private events quite frequently. We used to before COVID, and now we can really feel them starting to come back where um, you can rent the space for a private event, um, okay. Christmas party, an event. Um, I'm being rude, but could you replicate this event for my clients? I will pay you to replicate this event. This is awesome. I'm gonna shut up now. Yes, Pam, we can do that for sure. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, I think maybe, let's see. Um, thank you, Allie, for the kind words about uh, the painkiller. The first time you having a painkiller, it was at Virago. And um, your kind words about the tasting room. We've spent a lot of time and energy making it have just the right feel. Um, so we, we feel fortunate that, um, that we've created this nice vibe. It's so a good you space. may talk about the old fashioned real quick or no? Uh, yeah, why don't you give a little bit of information about the old fashioned and we'll turn it back over to Rain to make it. So the last one that Rain's gonna do is called an old fashioned, which is a classic, but it's so classic that it was originally just called a cocktail. So in 1806, the first written uh, reference to the cocktail, uh, and now mind you, cocktails were intended to be day drinkers, straight day, morning, sorry, morning drinks to get over the hangover from the night before, okay? Uh, and there was a book called the, the Balanced Columbian Repository. <laughs> I don't know what that is. Uh, it's supposed to be uh, liquor composed of spirits of any kind, sugar, water, and bitters. That was it. That was the cocktail recipe. In 1888, that was already known. So what, eight, about 80 years later, that, that cocktail was known as the old fashioned. There's a guy named David Wondrich. If you've never read any books by David Wondrich, he's a cocktail uh, writer and he's hilarious and he's super smart on his stuff. He's made a living off of booze, which not easy to do. Um, he, his first reference to the old fashioned was in 1833. <laughs> and according to him, the reason that people added the sugar and the bitters was as a cover basically for relatively harsh spirits that were available at the time. Um, particularly rum, uh, well, bourbon and, and whiskey and rye, but rum in particular was at the time was harsh. They called, they called it Kill Devil. If you ever want to know what Kill Devil Hill was all about, that's rum. Uh, and also Rumbolian were the uh, less than positive names, which is where rum comes from, those names basically. Uh, but uh, the old fashioned about 1833, somewhere in there. Um, and it's the same recipe. Today. But most people think of an old fashioned as with bourbon. Mm -hmm. And um... people forget though, that when they came up with the definition, okay, we were not yet, bourbon drinkers we as, as a country as a country so oh. particularly during our earlier colonial periods right after war of 1812 pe people were still rum drinkers because we hadn't really expanded too far over the Appalachian Mountains and it was just when you expand west it was difficult to ship molasses it was, it was heavy and, and and expensive so 
the Scots and the Irish that moved over into Kentucky and Ohio and the like, took their own distilling methods and distilled with the ingredients that they had, which was corn. Uh, and that's where we got bourbon from. And eventually that took, overtook uh, uh, rum. In addition, after the War of 1812, people were just done with Britain. So anything that was British in nature was uh, viewed as a negative from a social perspective. And rum was all British at that time here. So no one wanted rum, which killed rum basically until now, uh, which is why we're trying to bring it back. But it does make a great old fashioned. And yes. It makes a great old fashioned. So. Rain, are you ready to take over the old fashioned? Yes, absolutely. All right, old fashioned. So you can use any uh, rum that you've got. Um, I'm gonna use the four quart again. Um, the two ounces. A couple dashes of bitters um, at the Angostura. Do about three. You really, it's, it's up to your personal preference. Hey, Rain, can you talk a little bit about different bitters? Because I know sometimes we use orange yes. bitters. If people don't have Angostura, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so we're using Angostura right now, but um, some favorites, I love like black walnut bitters if you're doing like brown sugar as your sweetener and your old fashioned. Um, orange bitters are also great. I use those a lot um, here in the tasting room. Um, yeah, you can use really any kinds of bitters. Um, and the same with the sweetener. You can use demerara, you can use white sugar, you can use brown sugar. Um, I'm going to do a, a, just a white sugar simple syrup. And I'm going to do about a quarter of an ounce, but you can do as much as you like. Some people like the old fashioned a little sweeter. And then we'll add your ice. We're gonna stir. And can you mention why you're stirring this content, this cocktail instead of shaking it? Yes. So there is no acid in the, this cocktail. There's no lemon juice, and um, it's just um, booze and sugar, and that is why we stir it rather than shake. Um, shaking cocktails, they typically it's because you've got the um, the, the lemon juice in there and it's gotta really like um, break down and get emulsified. Uh, I'm gonna grab my strainer. Um, you can do the old fashioned in over a cube. I don't have one right now, but that's typically my favorite way over like a big cube. Um, I think one of the most important steps is your citrus oil. So you're gonna take a peeler, get you a nice peel, and then you're gonna squeeze it on top. Get all those essential oils onto the top of the drink. And I like to rub it around the, um, the rim as well. And just drop it in there. And there you go, an old fashioned. Thanks, Rain. Yeah. Um, okay, so Julie has been here a couple of times. Um, and Julie said that last time she was here, we had a smoked old fashioned, how do we make it? And it was delicious. And Julie, you'll be happy to know it is back on the menu for May and June. So if you can come by sometime in the next six weeks, you will have the smoked old fashioned. Rain, can you show that real quick, just how, what we use for the smoked old fashioned and what we do? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it's pretty simple. Um, so we've got like a cedar plank here. Um, you can use, I think, really any type of wood. And um, yeah, you just light it up. And let me grab a glass. One thing that is important is to add some, uh, to um, wet the glass first. So get your glass nice and wet. Um, And then you're going to put it over there and just kind of the residual water is going to help trap all that smoke into the glass. And it gives it a nice flavor. You just let that sit while you make your cocktail and then pour it in there and then you've got, yeah, some, some nice flavor in there. Yep. 
Thanks, Rain. Yeah. Turn the glass up. Let me see what smoke come out. Oh. All right. Ooh. I don't know how dramatic it looks over the Zoom, but. <laughs> I thought it was awesome. <laughs> yeah. We're ready for, do you have more information or you just want to open it up for Q&A? No, anything else they want to know about. I mean. Do you want to talk about gin at all or? Yeah, I mean, sure. Uh, gin basically, our still behind us right now is not uh, strong enough to actually make high proof spirits. Um, it caps out at about 160 proof. To, in order to get gin, you need something. Uh, because again, as I said, it, it's a great uh, solvent. And what you do is you end up mixing uh, high proof spirits, in our case, 192 proof, which is about as much as you can get. Um, even if you distill in a lab, you can distill in a vacuum, which means you distill at, at, at room temperature. Uh, but even in a controlled environment like a lab, you're going to cap out at about 195, 196 uh, proof. Um, we get 192. And then what we do is we take all our ingredients and you really can't see because the, the camera's facing the wrong way. But any gin could have anywhere from 20 to 30 ingredients in it. Um, ours has 10. Um, and uh, the problem with it is, is that if you run a, a gin run on a still like this and you end up, uh, it's like a casserole, right? If you make it and you don't like it, you try to reverse engineer what you didn't like about it. And it's really not that all that efficient. Uh, on top of that, it would probably take about 20 grand worth of expenses to try and redo a still of this size. So we had test stills and um, uh, part of my uh, uh, college graduating senior's job was to run single distillations on everything that we might want to use in gin. So we've got a wall of jars over here uh, of single things. That way, if we ever want to take uh, test a new gin, we can take two drops of that, five drops of this. And it's cheap rather than burning through thousands of gallons of, uh, of gin. Um, we decided to do something unique. Um, <clears throat> most gins are what you're used to, at least here in Virginia, are what they call London dry style. So it's your beef feeder, your tangere. Uh, your, they're high in juniper. Uh, they smell like Christmas trees and or pine cones. Uh, and that's what they're intended to be. And they're, they're great for what they are. The new trend in gin uh, is called the modern gin. It started in Japan and New Zealand, and now it's come to the United States. The idea is that you diminish the amount of juniper. It still needs to be 50% or so of juniper per uh, TTB, AB, ABC law, um, but no one's really measuring it. It still has to taste like gin, but it doesn't have to be a Christmas tree bomb. Uh, and we've gone ahead and used other, uh, other spices and, and botanicals that other people don't use. My legal career takes me to China a lot, uh, and my brother married into a Taiwanese American family. Uh, and as a result, we decided to play with uh, Silk Road spices. So if you taste our gin, which I, to be honest, I'm, I'm, I'm biased, but, and he's not here, so I don't mind giving him a compliment. But uh, his gin, my brother did the gin. It's excellent. A um, lot of uh, Sichuan peppercorn, uh, which other people don't use, uh, oolong tea, uh, lemongrass, lemon peel, uh, a lot of uh, East Asian, Southeast Asian flavors that you would not get in a normal gin. It is super cool. And then we've taken that, the one contribution I gave the gin was we took that gin and basically made a hibiscus orange gin out of it that we sell here. It is a blood red gin uh, and it is super cool. And it's just the same gin that we normally do, but it has the addition of hibiscus flowers and uh, a ton of orange peel. Um, and those are our gins, and they're, we, they, we've been super uh, pleased with the results, and people have seemed to enjoy it quite a bit. So if you've never tried the hibiscus gin or the regular gin, you're missing out. What questions can we answer for you guys? <laughs> yeah, feel, yeah. feel free to unmute yourself, too, if you just want to ask a question. Yes, Pam, we can. Thank you. <laughs> have lunch. Yes, we can do lunch. <laughs> the, the cool thing, the oolong gin, so April mentioned it. They kind of, if, if you get our gin, and our gin is at some, most of the ABC stores now that we want to be in, but I was hoping that the Szechuan peppercorn, because I'm a big spicy food fan, I was hoping that through distillation, the Szechuan peppercorn would 
you'd get that weird tingle on your on your tongue like you do when you eat uh, Szechuan uh, peppercorns in food, and you don't. So I was kind of bummed about that until I tasted it, and it, it actually turns into a very funky black pepper. So if you actually taste the gin on its own, you'll get it at the front of your tongue, you'll get, taste this explosive black pepper, which is really cool. And then if you swallow and just hang on to the flavor for a second, you'll actually taste the oolong tea on the back and the sides of your tongue. It's super bizarre, but it, it, it actually, once you people, once you tell somebody to experience it, they'll think, oh my God, I get it, right? But you might not get it on your own if you weren't told to, to, uh, to, to look for it, so. I gotta, I gotta speak up because I worked with Fred in a giant law firm for a few years. And I gotta tell you, he is literally one of the favorite people in my entire 26 year legal career. Um, sweet, sweet guy, smart as heck. And literally I cried when he left. Um, you abandoned me, Brad, I'll never get over it. Um, Vicki, God bless you. You've got a wonderful husband, a wonderful family man. And I'm so happy to see you guys being so successful. This stuff rock. I would hire you for a private event. I would promote you to the moon and back. It's just awesome. And so if you want to do private events, I can arrange that like at uh, the estate at River Run. I just had Virginia Business Magazine with my firm in there. It's awesome. Um, but also to have a client event, if you guys want to host it or kind of host it or do what you want. Call me. This rocks. This rocks. That's Vicky's uh, area. I, I'm, in, I'm in production. They don't let me talk to humans. I understand why. I know I'm teasing. <laughs> Brian, you're, you're super sweet. But no, um, Vicky, so you know, I was also in marketing before I went into law. So what you guys are doing is brilliant and go tribe, right? Um, yeah. So anyway, I've enjoyed it so much. Thank you. Yeah. Brad, you want to talk about distribution outside of Virginia? Yeah, we've been very. very and what about New England, like especially? Uh, um, so we've been fortunate um, up until last. So you got to remember, <laughs> a year ago, pandemic hits, right? And it, it shows you just the, the change in our mindset within a short period of time. We've gone from, oh, my God, how are we going to sell this stuff to, oh, my God, how are we going to make enough, which we never thought we would go to it's, through a pandemic, I might add. We started last year in Virginia in 20 stores, actually no storage. Uh, and now we're in over a hundred, I'm sure in Virginia. On top of that, we got picked. So we won a very, again, I don't want to to our own home, but we won a big prestigious award uh, in the industry. And as a result, Total Wine came by and, and asked to pick us up. So now they put us in 22 stores in Florida. We're also in Georgia, South Carolina, Connecticut, Delaware, and Illinois. Now, if you're in Boston, we also have two uh, internet distributors that will ship pretty much anywhere in the country. Um, and they're on our website. One of them is called Sealbox, uh, S-E-E-L-B-A-C-H-S, -E yeah, yeah. I think. Mm -hmm. And the other one is- Sherry's. Well, Sherry's in DC will do it, but also the one in Illinois is- um, Spirit Hub. Spirit Hub. So those, uh, you can go, and we have links to all of them on our website. So just because you're in a location where and it's viragospirits.com, but it, just because we're not in your local stores doesn't mean you can't get it there. Um, and if you're in um, Boston, if you're not, um, I don't need to pump up the competition, but there's a woman named Maggie Campbell. Uh, she's a Virago in my opinion. <clears throat> she runs a distillery up in Ipswich called um, Privateer. If you've not had their rum, then you're missing out. Um, Brad, Deirdre wants to know how much are we currently able to make? Well, <clears throat> it's interesting because it all depends upon the product, right? So with gin, it only takes one pass through the still. With rum, it takes two. So as a result, it takes twice as long to distill rum. So if you're saying we're going to do nothing but rum, um, it really cuts into our production. If we were going with 50-50 rum and gin, it changes. Um, I will tell you that we are, we overbought on still and that's okay. So our production, we have plenty of growth <laughs> opportunity. We also have plenty of space. We will eventually get another still like this one in the back. Uh, and there is actually a piece that runs in between those, that we, uh, those two pieces you see behind us that will allow us to distill on a 24 hour consistent 
nonstop basis. Um, but your question's an interesting one, and we thought about it from a theoretical perspective. I don't think we actually know the correct answer because it all depends upon the mix of what demand is requiring. Yeah. Um, similarly, most people, if you go to the islands, so you have to ferment molasses, right? You have to make a molasses wine. And, you, and molasses wine, you end up with about seven or 8% alcohol out of. Down in the Caribbean, they'll ferment out in two days, sometimes less. Uh, we take the, pro and this is the geeky uh, beer guy in me. I, we basically ferment as if we're lagering beer. So our fermentation has lasted a month. Um, as a result, it is slow, it is, uh, but the flavors are just clean and crisp and it's really, really, really worth the effort, but it slows the process down. So again, I guess the question becomes, what are we making and what is the process by which we wanna do it? I'm not, we have a theoretical answer, is that if we ran 24 hours a day and we were making nothing but rum, but it's really not a practical answer for us because I don't think we would ever do that. Right. Um, that being said, we will never run out. We have more capacity on this still than we are currently utilizing. So we have years worth of growth on that still mm -hmm. before we outgrow it. Mm -hmm. And it's brutal to, um, to distill here in the summertime because our space is not air conditioned. The tasting room itself is, but the production space is not because as Brad mentioned earlier, you want those barrels to get hot and cold and you want them to, to be humid in the summertime. So when we're running this still in the summertime and it's already a hundred degrees back here, it is brutal, brutal. Um, so we told ourselves about a year ago that we will never, ever, ever do that again. And we will be distilling this summer because, because demand. We have um, to stop doing that. I, we have to stop doing that. Exactly. Um, you know, you always say that, right? I'll never do that again. Yeah, I mean, the other reason it doesn't work in the summertime is that this piece of equipment right behind me is basically a condenser. So if you've ever seen the show Moonshiners, you'll see these guys in the woods with a barrel with it has a, a copper coil in it, where you and it, it running through water. And what it does is it attempts to cool steam liquid uh, or steamed uh, alcohol into back into liquid form by condensation. This design, um, again, is from like the 1600s. It, it, it depends upon, you gotta keep that water cold, right? And it takes us 12 hours to run a cycle on this still. After a period of, of hours, you've constantly been sticking hot steam in that through that water. It raises the temperature of the water up. And as a result, it, it doesn't condense the steam that's to come as much as it did the steam that came before it. So if you add that to the fact that this can be, this room can get into the nineties, uh, it's not an efficient system in terms of you're losing a lot of alcohol through evaporation that you can't control. Uh, just steam coming out the top and, and inability to keep uh, temperature control, which is why we prefer to do it in the winter time where it's cold. But we'll be doing it this summer. Yeah, well, we prefer <laughs> what we prefer and what we get to do is two different things. Thanks, you guys. I feel like we're close to the end. Tim, do you need to step back in? Nope. Um, thank you all. Thank you both so much. That was fantastic. Um, thank you all for joining us. Um, like I mentioned, we will be sending out the recording tomorrow. So um, if you'd like to view it again, you'll be able to do so. Um, we'd also love if you could fill out the survey you'll receive just so we know what we did well, what we can do better, um, and what you'd like to see in the future. So um, thank you all again for joining. And um, Brad and Vicki, thank you. Thank you, Rain. Um, everyone have a great evening. Bye, guys. Thanks, everybody. Thanks so much, y'all. Bye. Thanks, everyone.